Welcome to Healthy University, where we'll discuss issues and subjects on how you can live a healthier and more productive life. And now, here's your host for Healthy University, Alan Eisenberg. Hi, this is Alan Eisenberg, and welcome to another episode of Healthy U. It's a very special episode. I'm with my friend uh, Bob Wright uh, from Stress Free Now. And as you know, in the past, I've had Bob and Christine on, Christina's wife. And um, this subject we're going to talk about today is something very close to both of us right now. It's, it's death. Um, I lost my father, and unfortunately, Bob lost Christine, his wife. And um, we're going to talk about it. I mean, we're just going to open up and uh, talk about death, talk about how we handle it. Uh, hopefully offer some tips along the way. So welcome, Bob. Sorry it's on such a bad note, but welcome to the show. Well, Alan, uh, thank you for that introduction. That, that, that was wonderful. And um, I'll just start off by saying, you know, I lost my, my unicorn. You know, Christine and I, um, you know, were fortunate in the sense that, uh, you know, we were uh, partners, uh, not just marriage partners and, and um, uh, business partners, but also friends. And, um, we, you know, I tell people what underlaid uh, our entire relationship was our friendship because we, we, we met and were friends for, for about 18 months before we uh, got, uh, before I asked her out to date me. And um, which uh, at the time, she, she didn't say yes. She said, oh, I'll, I'll get back to you because she says, I'm taking care of my aunt. And uh, she said, I'll get back to you in a month. <laughs> hmm. So, so um, you know, the thing is, um, I, I, I want to say, Alan, uh, to, our, to, to our audiences, that um, the, the conversation that we're having today is all too rare because it's very rare for for two men to have uh, any kind of in-depth conversation about grief in private, but to have uh, a public in-depth dis- discussion um, is uh, uh, exceedingly rare. In fact, uh, uh, I'd have to really hunt around probably on uh, YouTube or someplace on the internet to see if I can find you know, in-depth recordings between two men uh, talking about grief. But I, I, I know there are bereavement groups and, and things like that, but I'm, I'm talking about um, just having a conversation, just how we, you know, like we're talking in the living room. And that's one of the great things about podcasts, which, you know, compared to radio, um, the, the, the podcast is fantastic in, in the sense that it allows you to, to time shift. And, you know, a radio show, if you miss it, it's gone. And, um, and so, so, Alan, I want to thank you for accepting my invitation to switch our uh, intended topic from fake news, which is a very important topic, but we can do that at another time. But since we have both had uh, close uh, 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 family members pass away recently, and uh, I, I think it's, it's apropos for us to have this conversation. Uh, a very ironic aspect of this is that a year ago, Christine and I were at uh, Yale University, and it was, um, I had, was making a presentation to the Consciousness Society on grief recovery. And uh, it also happened to be the um, uh, reunion weekend for um, my class at Yale, and um, so it was quite, quite interesting, but Christine was um, too sick um, that particular day I made my presentation on, on, the, on the grief, um, however, it's something that we talked about for the 17 months that, uh, from the time we found out her, her, her diagnosis, so um, I just want to say, Alan, thank you so much, and, and, I, and I hope this will be the first of a series about um, uh, uh, grief and grief recovery, and because there are many different forms of grief. So, for example, I've written extensively about existential grief, 
which deals with intangible losses, which many people, um, they go, what? What is that? You know, they've heard of existentialism, but basically in, in, in uh, practical everyday language, it's just, you know, when you have an intangible loss, you know, like uh, a betrayal of trust, or, you know, you have a you, uh, loss of... Uh, uh, a loss of a sense of community, or, uh, or you know, it, 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 it's dealing with, you know, a lack of, of, of um, faith or a loss of, of a sense of um, um, uh, a belief in a, a deity or, you know, that there's a spirit. And... Um, uh, importantly for many people, uh, not having a sense of being from anywhere. Like if you came and grew up in a family where you, you know, moved around every two years or that kind of thing, and um, it shows itself in adulthood because a person has a hard time uh, making close friendships because they, they were moved around as a child and then as an adult, um, you know, they have attachment issues. Yeah, and it's interesting that you bring up, you know, the different types of grief, and and also I think it's it's important that uh, we share the fact that we both experienced what was a lengthy illness that that ultimately led to um, the death of our loved ones. Um, I know for me, my father, it had been a six-year battle, and then really the last nine months, we knew he had an incurable form of cancer. Um, I don't know how long you knew that, you know, Christine's ultimate uh, fate was going to be death, but, you know, it, these, these things are inevitable. And when we talk about men not sharing or when we talk about, um, you know, grief counseling and grief recovery, uh, nothing, nothing can really be underplayed. Everybody is different and how they handle it is different. I know I was talking with my mother uh, today about that and how this one woman was questioning how could she not be going to grief counseling and she said well I'm I'm living in this older community I have a community of people to talk to and and I do believe that talk is really important and I believe this conversation that we're having about uh, grief about how we handle it about what we know about the stages of grief um, and and even the way that you know I, I hear how you're handling it you heard um, how I handled it a few weeks ago uh, my father passed about three weeks ago and I think that it's you know it's it may surprise people to hear us you know not weeping and not crying and not being in an anger place or in, in some of these things that we know are stages of grief but the other part is that there was a lot of preparation, at least for me, and, and probably I'm guessing for you, in, in the inevitable, and in that this was coming. And even though no matter how much you prepare for it, it's never enough to, to quell the issue, um, it, it did help. It did help me to be able to say goodbye, to be able to spend the time I did spend with my father. Um, and, you know, I, Although I was somewhat surprised when you contacted me about Christine, I know, you know, she was very private in, in keeping a lot of things private, but I, I knew, you know, somehow, and I think it's this high sensitivity that I talk about, you know, that I'm highly attuned, um, that I knew when, when we talked because Christine and you called me when my father passed, I had a sense that would be the last time I would be talking to Christine, so... You know, what did, what did you oh, find? Oh, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I just, I, again, it's these senses that happen with me um, because I'm highly sensitive that I could just tell, you know, that, that she, it was like my dad, the Friday before my, my dad died on a Sunday, and the Friday before, I knew that was going to be the last Friday I saw. I knew I was going to be the last day I saw him. Um, I, I just knew it, and I, I can't kind of explain it other than, a sense of sort of that that listening to someone hearing someone and knowing that that's kind of it although you know I admit every week I prepared myself I just knew he had done something that last Friday where you know as we were leaving his room um, and he had been very alert and very you know very much part of um, 
uh, he hadn't lost any any mental faculties along the way. And then that Friday, he he said something to my youngest son that was say hi to you know, my older son's girlfriend, and, and I knew he didn't even know who was in the room. And I just knew I knew at that point I'm like he he's not aware anymore, and and that was going to be it. Right, um, you know, Alan. I remember when I saw the uh, message that that your father had passed. I turned to Christine, who we was sitting in the living room, and I said, "Oh, I'm I'm going to uh, call Alan. You know that this was the thing. Um, you know, I wanted to pick up the phone." And yeah, and you made a, a very good point. Um, uh, and and I want to emphasize this to the audience that 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 uh, that grief and grieving is unique to each individual. You know, some people are very verbal. You know, um, I know when um, uh, I had a friend in for my master's program, and uh, Christine was supposed to uh, have lunch with her on a Saturday, and she had been waiting. To, um, to hear from her in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the, where they were going to uh, uh, meet for lunch and, and the time, et cetera. And so if this was on a Tuesday, the Tuesday before the Saturday, and I get this email that uh, came in and it says, sorry to announce that um, Anne Marie has uh, passed away. And I remember um, um, Christine said, I... Um, I screamed. I was in front of my. <laughs> um, I don't remember screaming, but I, you know, she said, you know, I screamed. I guess, oh no, or something like that. But I, I was like a, a real shock because um, in that particular case, Anne Marie, she um, one of the things that she did was she was a spoken word artist, and so I remember we went to see her at the uh, Bowery Poetry uh, uh, Theater which is no longer there, by the way, in Manhattan. And, um, and when she came off the stage, she was so fantastic. These were uh, like the regional competitions. I think they placed third place or team. Um, she sat down next to me, and I said, Oh, Amory, that was fantastic what you did. I said, I can't believe you, you revealed so much about yourself. And she said, Bob, I didn't reveal anything about myself. That's my alternate uh, persona. She said, I didn't say anything. Mm. And so uh, and it's only in hindsight that I realized how true that was because I did not know that, uh, you know, she was um, clinically depressed because she had this outward exterior. And at the end, she actually committed suicide. Mm. And then, um, you know, which was a total shock. And then at her, at her um, uh, a memorial service, there was the picture that, um, you know, I had hired her to uh, perform at an event I was doing. There was, the, out of all the pictures that they had, there was the lone picture um, taken from my event on top of her casket. So I turned to Christine and I said, oh my gosh, how could this be? And then I went to her brother and I said, how is it that my picture is the picture uh, on top of the casket? And, she, and her brother said, said, Bob, you have no idea how much your, your, your friendship and the friendship with Christine meant to my sister. He said, in fact, you know, when we found her, she was looking at the pictures from your event. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, they, so, you know, so Alan, you know, so it, it, it's shocking. And then the other thing I want to say is, you know, I've been receiving calls and, and making calls. Uh, to let people know, you know, um, as you said, many people did not know um, Christine had been um, suffering for basically the last 17 months because her original diagnosis, when we got it um, uh, last year, was, you know, she had stage 4 breast cancer. And so, you know, we were in a state of shock. And, you know, we went into the emergency room. She basically... Um, was dehydrated and so they said well what's going on with her breast and so uh, what we found out is um, you know they didn't tell us you know oh it's stage four they just when the breast surgeon came said she's not a candidate for surgery and so that that's what that actually meant what we found out wow. and so so much of this road has um, 
has been, um, you know, uh, to use the uh, the, fav- the famous uh, Robert Frost metaphor, the road less traveled. You know, and I know you must have that 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 feeling too. You know, when you were a kid, you weren't thinking, you know, uh, um, my father would die like this, or this would, would happen in my family. So it it, it, it you can't even predict. Um, you know, I'm sure. You know, you, you I think you mentioned that he was in remission for a while, yeah. and then it came back. So the other thing I want to say is that in Christine's case, you know. Um, you know, we had every expectation that she would have a full recovery. We had so many people praying for her, sending her healing energy. She was doing detox and nutrition on top of that. And I believe that she she lived longer than she would have if those things hadn't been happening. In fact, uh, her oncologist asked her, Christine, how is it you still have your hair after all this chemotherapy you've done? And um, so I believe it's because we had so many people praying. Um, uh, uh, in fact, I got an email this week from um, a, a, a friend uh, who we only met recently um, and became a fast friend. She's traveling in Austria, and she sent me the email and said, I've been praying for, for Christine in the, the most spiritual part of Austria. And she sent me a picture of, uh, of some mountain. I, I don't know the name of it. Um, I don't speak German, but um, so so I think that you know there there are other elements here. And then the, the uh, finally, I just want to say the the aspect of shock when I told people who you know both people that knew Christine you know had been ill and people who weren't. Um, the, the you know the you know the fact that she had passed away. Um, some people, you know, just, it, it was almost too much for them. And, and um, in fact, I just took a call from a couple in um, Princeton, New Jersey, who just expressed their utter shock, you know, uh, that, that she had passed away because she was still very young. And, and, and yeah. um, but, you know, many people have um, passed away at a, a young age. And so, um so again, Alan, I want to thank you for uh, for doing agreeing to do a show like this because I I know um, you know in my writing you know what I've I've said to people and and also in my uh, brief presentation if you live long enough you will experience the death of a close loved one or a beloved pet and uh, and and personally know what grief is. And so, so, um, and again, as you mentioned, it is, the experience is unique to each individual and then, you know, how it manifests itself in terms of, you know, uh, does the person, you know, go into depression or does the person, um, you know, um, act like nothing's going on or is the person sobbing? Um, you know, all of those are, are, are natural uh, reactions. And I, 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 and I, and I want to um, just emphasize this. You know, the, the, um, you know, in the literature, they make a big difference between uh, the, the, the words grief, bereavement, and mourning. But in everyday life, it's all the same. You know, I don't care what yeah. you call it. And um, all we know is that it hurts. But basically, the, the purpose of grief is to help the, um, the, the, the person uh, who, who is left to recalibrate their system. And so if you think about how animals in the, in the wild um, who've been attacked by a predator, so let's say a lion is chasing an antelope, and let's say that the, the antelope um, barely escapes the, the claws of the lion is on his back, and you know, uh, anyone that's uh, watched Wild Kingdom has probably seen that, and then the, the, the antelope is able to get away, and what you'll notice right away if the animal will shake vigorously for maybe 5, 10, 15 seconds and then continue on their business. And so that is would be an example of, of how, um, you know, um, in humans that the, the purpose of the grief period is to be able to shake off the, 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 the trauma of, of, the, of the close loved one passing. It's just that, you know, most people haven't learned how to shake like that. 
but it, it's actually the same thing. Well, and it's not it's not always um, easy or or normal. Um, I think what we all what we all know, but we don't tend to talk about, you know, is is that every everything and everybody will die, and we yeah. can't we cannot predict when that's going to be. You know, my father was seventy five. To some people, that was really young. Um, Christine was obviously younger, I, I believe, and you yeah. know, there is no there is no magic day. So, you know, one of the things that I I always have to keep in my mind, and this is my own, you know, healing and spirituality, is that today could be the last day. So, how am I going to live it? You know, and how do I want to leave this world? And and how how do I want to make sure that the people I care about are taken care of? I think. Um, you know, in, in many cases, there's there's no easy answer. It's like you said, there's no there's no quick and easy. Oh well, this is how I'm going to handle this grief. Um, you know, grief for for me and probably for you right now come in, comes in waves. You know, you a memory strikes you or or something happens. It, it takes it takes a period of time. And and you know, in certain religions like my own, you know, there's a there's a period of mourning, a direct period of mourning of seven days and then a year and then you know it's supposed to stretch on and all that's supposed to help you kind of balance your own grief and how long you get to grieve for before you do certain things but obviously everybody's different and i know there's people in the audience who go you know i i can't get past this grief i'm in and, and, and you know i have known people who have lost children you know I, i've known people who have taken their own lives as, as you were saying and, and and you know and, and all the people are left with that and I think that that's that's a struggle that that everybody is an individual on and you you have to make your own decisions on how you want to handle it one of the, one of the important things is not to not handle it because self-care at times like this is almost more important than dealing with you know this this loss is you have to deal with yourself. You have to deal with the emotions you're feeling. How are you going to lay those out? How are you going to, you know, express the way you feel, express the emotions that you're going through? Because, you know, the worst thing we can do is, is disappear inside them, in my opinion. Um, it's just, it's something that you have to deal with. And there is no preparation. There's no, this is how I'm going to deal with it. You can... You can kind of come up with plans, but when it strikes, um, you're not always ready. So I think knowing how you do self-care is really important. Bob, we have to take a quick break, um, but when we come back, let's just continue talking. I think, you know, obviously, I feel like we're just starting out. Um, but when we come back, you know, let's let's delve deeper into how, how you're handling it, how I'm handling it, and how what we know about the stages of grief and, and the natural course of grief goes in, right? So, so if you'll stay with me, we'll be right back with more Healthy You. You're listening to Healthy University with Alan Eisenberg. This is Alan Eisenberg from Healthy You. 
If you're ever looking for a place to host your podcast, try Podcast Garden. Podcast Garden hosts Healthy You and is really reasonable and a great place uh, for your podcast to be hosted. So remember, host your podcast at podcastgarden.com. Hi, this is Alan Eisenberg, back with Healthy You. Today I'm here with uh, Dr. Bob Wright, and what we're talking about, we've just both had recent losses of our loved ones, and we're talking about death and grief and, and how we handle those things. So, Bob, you know, we, we were kind of talking about how how we're handling it. How are, I, I mean, yours is very recent. How are you How are you dealing with it right now? Okay, so, so Alan, um, uh, in, in my case, um, I'm, I'm actually doing quite well because I actually feel as if the um, during those past 17 months, Christine and I working through this thing, we 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 been we were able to grieve together, and so in in terms of you know how the uh, disease state was manifesting itself, and um, so we actually had many discussions on various levels. Um, uh, about, you know, what was going on and, you know, how unfair it was. And, in fact, uh, you know, we have, you know, some friends that are, do- a good friend that's a doctor. She's both an MD and a holistic MD. And when, um, you know, we, we, we turned out, found out the first diagnosis in, in March 2017, but in October 2017, we found out a second uh, that she had a second cancer, and our friend said, "Are you sure? Because you realize how rare that is in the literature." She said, "Are you sure?" And well, unfortunately, yeah, it was was uh, it was true. And so, um, so part of the whole process of, of, as you say, working through is is the fact that um, uh, in in in, in both our cases, um, Christine had worked through her, her grief um, from the, the, the death of her mom, which was totally traumatic for her um, back in 1998. You know, she was the only child, so, and then the way she found out about it, um, you know, just, uh, it, it devastated her. And, and, then, um, and then, you know, she was caring for her aunt, and then, you know, the, her aunt ended up with the Alzheimer's, and that, that, so that was very tough to, you know, see someone who had been vibrant, et cetera, get to the point where she would look into the mirror and she would be afraid thinking somebody's breaking into the house because she doesn't recognize that her own reflection is her. And mm-hmm. so, you know, the breakdown in the brain and the, uh, the memory systems, et cetera. But, um, I, I want to um, uh, uh, say this, you know, because you, you brought up this issue a couple of times in terms of the stages of grief. You know, in, 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 in my study, um, one of the things that I looked at was, you know, the, the Kubler, Kubler-Ross model, you know, the five stages of grief, right. but um, which is actually on one side, but there's a, a totally opposite view of what grief is, um, you know, the, the, the guys at the, um, the Grief Recovery Institute, basically what they're saying is, is that, um, you know, the, the sense of loss that we experience in grief, it has to do with the, the fact that, that it's a loss in being able to communicate with the, with the, um, the, the departed and the sense that you have of, of um, you know, simultaneously... Uh, missing them and 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 also uh, not being able to say things that you would want to say, like for example, I wish I had listened to you, you know, or I wish I had had said goodbye, you know, those those kind of things, and 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 so, you know, talking about um, the loss in that way, you know, the incompleteness of the loss versus yeah. the uh, the stages. Also, one of the things, the misconception about the Kubler-Ross model, and she even said this herself, is that, you know, 
people took her her model a little too far. It right. wasn't meant to be, you know, uh, like a verbatim thing. It was just uh, basically a guide. It's like a guide code. And so, but uh, it, it's kind of become like calcified into, you know, this is how grief happens. So, so the way I look at it is that uh, the Kubler Ross model is, is like a left hemisphere analytical um, uh, dissection or deconstruction of grief. And the Grief Recovery Institute, the way they approach it, is more a right brain uh, 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 approach. But at the end of the day, to the person that's experiencing grief, it doesn't matter if it's left hemisphere, right hemisphere, it's whatever works for you. In my particular case, um, you know, I had I had uh, worked through the, the grief of, uh, for the death of my mother, you know, and as I said, you know, my mother passed away when I was seven years old. So um, it, it, it took a, a huge toll on me because, you know, I had never... Uh, gotten any therapy, or, and, and in fact, my mother's name was barely mentioned when she passed away, then that actually morphed into the existential grief. And, um, uh, and so, because I had worked through those things, and also Christine had worked through the grief, it was um, a, a, a much different experience than, than maybe some people experience. Because, um, you know, my wife had said to me, she said, oh, Bob, you know, I, I want to be there in September when we celebrate your father's birthday. She said, that is what my plan is. And so we were working hard to, 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 to make that happen. And unfortunately, you know, um, she passed away this week. And I was at her bedside uh, when she took her last breath. And um, what I can say is that I know she's at peace now because... Uh, she really suffered, and, uh, you know, some people are, are, are die and they don't suffer, but, you know, I have to say in the case of my wife, you know, she was such a gentle, caring, compassionate, other-oriented person, you know, that, that I, I felt, and she felt too, you know, she didn't deserve to have the type of pain, and here's what I'm talking about, you know, at the end, um, you know, she was being fed intravenously and had IV. So because she had been uh, throwing up, you know, and um, they had taken the tube out of her uh, stomach, the, um, um, she had gone seven days without any um, uh, water or, or food, you know, by mouth. And so she, I remember, uh, the doctor, I remember the doctor coming in saying to her, you know, Christine, I think tomorrow we could try, you know, maybe we could give you some liquids. You could have a, a couple of sips or some ice chips. And so that night she got fixated, and I, I literally had to use, you know, tools out of my uh, uh, toolbox to, to redirect her attention. Um, and, that, and that is one of the things I want to talk about before we close, Alan, is what are some of the practical things that people can do to assuage their, their grief um, when it's happening and then afterwards. So yeah. when I, uh, on the seventh day, when she was able to, to, to um, take a couple of sips, um, I had, you know, the water to give, give her, and she said, no, Bob. She goes, I give me the iced tea, because the doctor mm -hmm. said she could have, you know, that was a, a clear fluid. And I just remember taking a teaspoon, not even a tablespoon, to give her um, from the iced tea, and the expression of, of satisfaction, and I said, honey, uh, how does that feel? She says, Bob, it's been like I've been in the desert, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> for seven days. So, you know, if you could just imagine, I know sometimes I go 12 hours without drinking anything, how parched. So imagine, because uh, she said, I, 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 you know, I can live the rest of my life without food. But, you know, I have to have something to drink. And so, I mean, I, I, so sometimes when I think about that, um, you know, that level of suffering, you mm -hmm. know, I remember when, you know, I see, when I was a kid, I'd see a TV show and they showed how they torture people. They, they, they dig a hole and put the, the, the person in the sand and it'd just be like their head above and there would be uh, fire ants eating them. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, kind of the, um, 
analogy that I felt that she was going through. So I, you know, of course, if I could have taken any, um, you know, I made her as comfortable um, as I could. The, uh, the, the the doctors and the nursing staff were fabulous. You know, fortunately, she had a private room. You know, um, I, I just have to say, you know, I wouldn't wish, you know, anyone that kind of suffering. However, like I said, she, she has, is at peak now. Um, so um, I, I don't feel sad. You know, I have people asking me, you know, I know you feel sad. And so that is actually not the feeling that I have. In my particular case, I, I, I have a level of disgust and disappointment. Mm -hmm. um, the disgust is that, you know, such a, a loving person would be subjected to this type of suffering. And then the, the, and then the disappointment is that, you know, Christine and I were working on so many projects together, and, you know, I feel we were really on the threshold of some serious breakthroughs. And here's what I mean, Alan. So, for example, um, uh, about uh, six weeks uh, before she passed away, I, I came into her, uh, to her in the living room. I said, oh, honey, look, um, I, I see this three places on the internet that our podcast series, we're, we're listed in, in the top 50 uh, stress podcasts worldwide and the top 50 pain uh, relief uh, podcasts worldwide. So that that is a, a real accomplishment. Um, I don't know who makes up these lists or anything like that, but, you know, our podcasts like yours, Alan, you know, are heard on all over the world. And as we both know, the, the statistics that we get, are, you know, are not, don't really capture, you know, how many people really are listening. Because once a person downloads the thing, you know, you don't know how many people they pass it on to. And, and so, you know, ultimately, we all want people to subscribe. But, um, but I, I can tell you, um, I have been surprised, and you probably had the same experience. I've been places. In fact, I was at a funeral in New Jersey. And there, there were, it was for um, uh, uh, a buddy, you know, from, from my college days. And I had three people come up to me, and they said to me, Bob, how come I'm not getting your podcast anymore? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, how come I'm not on, the, on your list anymore? And I said, oh, I didn't know you were reading my, you know. <laughs> I didn't know. And so it's like the ultimate compliment. You have to know these people that I go, oh. They, they felt that I had slighted them. And so I came back to Christine with a smile when I, I said, honey, they thought that I had slighted them, but that wasn't the case. You know, sometimes my email um, was, it doesn't work properly, especially if I'm using it for my phone. And, and so, you know, it didn't, doesn't capture everything. And, and so, but it, it was a very good feeling to have to know that um, even though they're not showing up in my statistics, um, that they, they're listening. And I've had um, uh, another person who, who, who had emailed me finally after three years and said, oh, Bob, I've been listening to your podcast for years, and I know I've never told you, but, you know, uh, thank you for putting me on your family and friends list. So in my mind, Alan, I'm saying, well, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. So I don't know how to have to yeah. send it out like that. But, um, you know, um, but again, I, Alan, I, I just have to thank you again because this is a very special conversation, I think, for both of us. Yeah. And, 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 and I know it will help a lot of people. And, and here's how I know why. You know, uh, Christine and I were on a cruise, and I was um, in my normal place out on the deck, and I was um, writing like, like I like to do. And this guy comes up to me, and he says, hey, how come every time I see you, you're writing? He says, what are you writing? So I said, oh, I'm writing about grief and grief recovery, you know, about the death of my mother and what happened. So he sat down next to me, and the conversation that took place was, you know, just an amazing conversation. And here's what I mean. This guy was from South Carolina, and I happen to be in the state of South Carolina right now, and and. He said, you know, my mother died two years ago, and I'm the oldest brother, and um, so I had to be tough, and, you know, we were all had our bedside when she expired, and so, you know, people were saying, you know, you know, how come, you know, you're not crying, and et cetera, like everyone else, 
And he said, hey, you know, I, I, got, I got to take care of business, do what I got to do. So the bottom line is he's saying two years later, he says every single day he wakes up sobbing about the death of his mother. So he said to me, what's wrong with me? And I think that that's the thing that I want to get through to our audience. I told him, there's nothing wrong with you. It's, it's pretty clear that you're having a delayed grief reaction. In your case, it took two years. Yeah. Um, you know, other people, you know, two weeks. Uh, for some people, they never have the delayed grief reaction. Um, so what I told him, you know, it's normal to cry. I know a lot of men have a, a problem, you know, uh, sometimes with that. And then especially admitting that, 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 oh, my gosh, you know, you know, I'm hurt to that level. But it's okay, and I think there needs to be a conversation like we're having, Alan, where, yeah. you know, it's, it's okay. Like the way you talk about, you know, bullying, both being victim and being the bully, and then suicide, you know, these are all things that people don't, that don't like to talk about. They get swept under the rug. But these are all very real things that happen in our daily lives, and, and there's a lot of pain associated with it. And so, you know, you know, before we end this, um, this, um, this uh, chat, you know, let's talk about the things that you can do to help assuage your pain so that, that you can get to a place of at least being neutral where, where, where you're not suffering. Well, there are two, yeah, there are two things. And, um, you know, I think, I think this was a very cathartic uh, show, but, but I think particularly you've had a great chance to, um, to express it since you've been more recent. But, but I think there are two things that are really important. Um, and one you brought up, which is um, things left unsaid, things left um, that, that aren't said and, and not presented. And I, I always go back to, um, you know me, I'm a big movie buff. Uh, the Sixth Sense, which was a, a movie in the 90s, which was thought to be sort of a scary, suspenseful movie. And I, I immediately saw it differently after one scene. And it's a scene where the boy and his mother, so if you don't know the storyline, the boy can see and hear um, people that have recently passed. And his job is to bring them peace. They didn't have peaceful passings. And, and his job is sort of as a as a person to help guide them to to show the truth to the loved one so they can pass peacefully and it's at the very end he has this very um his mother seem, is seems very depressed and very sad and he's going through this this great moment of, of realization and it's toward the very end of the movie he looks at his mother and he says you know i saw grandma today and she's like what <laughs> and he's like, I saw your mother, your grandma, and she wanted me to tell you something. And, wow. And, she, and he says, what she wanted me to tell you is every day. What, what was she asking, Mom? Or what was she saying, Mom? And the mother starts to cry, and, and um, the boy says, she, he, she sees you going to her graveside and asking her a question. What's the question? And the mother, the mother says, you know, choking up, do I make her proud? And so she was asking the grave, you know, do I make her proud? And the boy could tell her every day was what her wow. mother was responding. And, and I think that that brought this closure, you know, his job was to bring this closure. And, and I always think about that. I always think about what if, you know, what if you could get that forgiveness or say those words that you didn't say because death isn't always like what you and I had, where we could say things to our, I could say things to my dad, and I did. And my dad could say things to me, and Christine could say things to you, you could say, but it doesn't always work that way. And, and you know, the other thing I always think about, uh, being a music buff too, is, is uh, Mike and the Mechanics song um, about his father passing away, and, uh, you know, how he didn't get to tell him all the things he wanted to say. And, and I always think that that's really important that, you know, the number one thing you have to do for yourself in my mind in grief and in death is both forgive the person that's passed for anything that they didn't ask forgiveness for 
but forgive yourself. You know, you're, you're the one that's still living. And what you don't want to do is, is suffer the rest of your life due to what is this, you know, unfortunately inevitable death, which is both unpredictable and, you know, when my, when my grandmother passed, her and I were not getting along. I was at a period where I was a rebellious teenager and she passed and I, you know, I won't tell you that there aren't days that I don't think about that, you know, that we didn't pass when things were good, but I have to forgive myself. So forgiving yourself and forgiving the, the other person that has passed, I mean, those are, those are essential to, in my mind, to recovery. Well, you know, Alan, one of the key things that, that, that you know, that I mentioned before, and you actually uh, 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 mentioned it also, is this issue of incomplete communication. And I think that, that that's one of the, the really powerful things about the grief recovery uh, uh, protocol. Um, so, audience, there, there's a book called The Grief Recovery Handbook, very famous um and so you can check that out if you're grieving. That, that would be one thing. And then there's also a, a, the Grief Recovery Institute where um, I think it's griefrecovery.com that if you go there, they, they have, uh, you know, uh, grief coaches who certify grief coaches uh, who, who do amazing uh, work. And, and um, it's very interesting, you know, Alan, uh, you know, when I was doing my dissertation, um, you know, uh, there's a you know big element uh, on the grief recovery, and so I remember um, uh, the chair of my committee when I submitted what I thought was a final draft. <laughs> he, he's reading this to the um, the letter that I wrote to my stepmother, and he says, "Bob, this doesn't sound like your theta waves are harmonized." <laughs> <laughs> And I, Christine and I used to laugh about that, and I was like, "No, well, I'm still mad at her, so this is as good as I can, as good as she can." You know, I felt, you know, she in many ways undermined um, myself and my brothers, and you know, was cruel and unusual punishment. And um, and so um, I was eventually able to recraft a letter where I was actually able to release that pain, you know, it reminds me of the Star Trek episode, you know, Star Trek V with Spock's brother, and he had that uh, gift where he could touch people's heart and find their deepest pain, and so the thing is to, to let that go, and, and Alan, on that note, I want to, uh, at some point, since you are a serious uh, movie TV buff, um, I hope we can do a podcast or two about something that was dear to Christine Park. You know, she was a serious Trekkie, and she, hmm. she had actually gone to a Star Trek convention, uh, you know, in costume. And, and that was one of the things that we had talked about doing, but we just never got around to it. But her favorite episode, and she, she had tried for years to get me to, and I mean literally years, you know, honey, I want you to watch this. Honey, I want you to watch I'm like, okay. So it's the Star Trek episode with Picard, and um, I can't think of the guy's name, but it's the you know it's the one that says Jalan his arms open wide, you line over the ocean. So it's literally left brain versus um, right brain, where the Enterprise was almost destroyed because um, they couldn't understand what they were saying, whether or not they were oh, friends or foes. Yeah. So when in doubt, you're a foe, we're gonna blast you, right? <laughs> and so that was um, the, the the guy um, that played in. Um, not deep space nine. Um, I can't. So I, I now I'm gonna now I feel bad because that was Christine's favorite episode. But I hope you know at some point you know um, because part of recovering from the grief is remembering the good times oh, yeah. and the good things um, and the wonderful moments. You know, I'm really you know for me you know when I said I'm not sad you know I I I feel good in the sense that Christine and I did a lot of things uh, and we're very fortunate and blessed to do some things that many people, you know, put off doing, like traveling and, um, and, and, and we made such fantastic friendships uh, from, you know, especially the longer cruises that we took and, you know, lifelong friendships where people came to our house and 
spent the night, and we went to their house and spent the night. And uh, in fact, um, you know, we made uh, some friendships where people we said, "Well, if you come to town and you're not home," and they said, "We'll leave the key under the mat." Mm. Well, I turned to Christina. I said, "These are not the kind of people that would joke about that." And sure enough, um, that um, when our, uh, our friend passed away, the husband passed away, and we went to their home. Uh, what we found out was the children said, um, you know, yeah, um, you know, um, you know, we don't even have a key. <laughs> so we were like, uh oh. So it, it's just, you know, it's just the kind of thing where, you know, sometimes, Alan, you know, you don't know the impact that you're having on other people's lives. So I've been feeling calls from people. In fact, you know, I'm driving to New York right now. And um, I have on my headset, and and um, uh, you know the the for example the pianist uh, who's going to perform at her service in New York, um, you know uh, I said to him, oh thank you. I said the person sitting next to me to the service in Florida said, oh you know uh, Pierre is a, a magnificent pianist. I said, oh he's that good. She said, oh yes. So when I spoke to Pierre, I said to him, I said, oh, I heard good things uh, about you from the repast. I said, you know, I'm looking forward to meeting you. And then he, to my total shock, he said, well, Bob, I've already met you. Mm. I said, I've met you? He said, yeah, don't you remember last, last May you were uh, in front of the church and, uh, and, and, and I was that guy that Christine, Christine introduced you to. So right. I was like, oh my gosh, so Alan, this is like maybe the third or fourth time um, where I've met someone in a different context, not realizing that I, I've met them, you know, with Christine, and then, you know, a, a year or two later, uh, and then they'll say, well, I, I, I've met you before, and I have no recollection because either the person lost 70, 80 pounds of weight, or, you know, I just remember the interaction differently. And um, so, um, but in, in terms of, 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 of one, another uh, solution uh, in terms of um, overcoming the, you know, or, or contributing to the grief recovery process is to, you know, write a letter to the person mm -hmm. that you lost, the close loved one, or your beloved pet, because, you know, I remember a colleague um, you know, I was totally shocked. She lost her, um, she came home and her puppy was of 18 months, I think she had the puppy, you know, had, had died unexpectedly. And she was so distraught over the death of her puppy, she said to me, she said, I'm, I'm, I'm more, uh, um, you know, uh, upset over the death of my puppy than the death of my mother. How powerful a statement is that? Well, and it's um, not you. And, and, yeah, and what she and I, so I said to her, I said, oh, I understand. The puppy was giving you unconditional love. You right. would come home. She said, yeah, the puppy used to scratch at the shower door. When I'd come home, he'd be there, and he'd just be there for me. And I think that that is um, this, this issue of, you know, what the, um, the hospice people told me, you know, um, right after Christine expired. Um, and I, I think this is very wise advice. She said to me, love lives on. She didn't say love never dies. Right. She said love lives on and, and it gets passed on. And so, uh, so, so, Alan, for you, I know your father's uh, love lives on. And I know for me, Christine loves lives on. And, you know, I had pledged at the ceremony to continue Christine's legacy and because, you know, she was in the process of, of completing two books and a couple of other projects. And so I, I will, um, you know, make sure that those get done. And one of the other things that we have wanted to do, again, why I say I felt like we were robbed, we, Christine had always wanted to um, adopt a class mm. of kids. And, uh, and years ago, um, I don't know if I told you this, 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 this story before, Alex, but years ago I was on the, um, the board of a, of a school, and I remember we went to um, 
uh, people who were potential donors who were quite wealthy, and of course we were there to ask for money. So when we sat down at the table, uh, the the guy says, he says, Bob, I hope you're not here to ask for money. <laughs> and so I said to him, I said, <laughs> so I didn't uh, ask. I said, listen, I said, I said, you're Jewish. I want to know how come. You raise over a million dollars every year to help African American children. That's what I want to know. Yeah. And then the people that I came with to the meeting, they were horrified. They had that look like, we're not with him, he's crazy, <laughs> right? <laughs> but I wanted to know. And because they were doing good work in the community. So I wanted to know what why were they doing this for years? And so uh, uh, he rolled up his sleeve. And he pointed to his arm. He said, we were in the concentration camps. Yeah. He said, see marks? And so we're, one, we're survivors of the concentration camps in yeah. Germany. And so he said, I have to tell you, the work that we are, have done with the, the kids in the school, he said, we take the, the kids that we're told that are least likely to succeed. In this particular case, this was in uh, Long Island in the Roosevelt School District. The um, the state had taken over the school. You know, the, it was that bad there. And so they went into the junior high school, and they said, give me the kids that are, are more, most likely to flunk out of school, like, right away. And those are the kids that they worked with. And what he said was, it's the most rewarding thing that they had ever done in their life to take children who who were told they were destined to fail and to see them graduate from high school and college and go on and get jobs making forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year. He said enough so that they could have provide for a family. And so that's the kind of thing that I would like to do, you know, that Christy and I wanted to do. And so um, you know, uh, so in that sense that's that has become, you know, my, my focus. You know, Christine was very task-oriented, and she, in fact, she liked to work more than I did. You know, I, I like to play a little bit more. <laughs> and she says, Bob, we can play after we get the work done. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she was a, yeah. a tough taskmaster. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's a, uh, you know, a great place to, to leave what, what is an important message um, at the end here, which is... There are so many ways to continue on the legacy of a loved one. I mean, I think we're all here on this earth for whatever amount of time we are um, to leave a lasting legacy of some sort. And, you know, if, if we're living right, then, then that's what we do. So I think what you're doing is so honorable. And again, I mean, you know, we're, you and I are kind of lucky because we integrated our loved ones into what we do. So Christine is on so many of your podcasts and my dad, I had him on one of my podcasts talking about his resiliency and positiveness through adversity. And so I can hear his voice whenever I need to, which is very comforting. And also know that, you know, he, he was this person that um, I never have to forget about. I don't have to sit, put in the back of my head. And then eventually, I think for the audience members, you know, your thoughts, whatever they will be, will turn to be good ones you know for me it was seeing screwball comedies like mel brooks movies with my dad and, and laughing in the aisles that was that was our our thing and i'm sure that everybody has their thing whether it's with their pets their you know and, and i i think you're right we, we don't discount the loved the loved pet um they're just as much of a family member as anyone else i would say so um I, you know, I've really enjoyed this show and our chance to get to, you know, explore ourselves a little bit. I think, you know, just talking about it, talk therapy to me is so, is so important and having a chance to talk about our loved ones and hopefully, you know, for, for the audience hearing, you know, those messages that we share that, you know, we're not, yeah, you know, we're, we're sad, we're, you know, we grieve, uh, but it's like you said, Kubler-Ross, doesn't, you're not necessarily going to follow those uh, steps of grieving. You're going to grieve how you're going to grieve and allow yourself that. I think the most important advice I can give is allow yourself to grieve as you're going to grieve. 
but at the same token, don't grieve forever. You know, find a way to turn it into something positive at the end, whether that's doing what you're saying, doing, adopting a school, or, or for me, you know, supporting Leukemia and Lymphoma Society for my dad. Um, you know, find a positiveness out of out of what is, you know, a and it, unfortunately for all of us, or fortunately, this is part of life. Death is part of life. So, so we move we move on. You know, we move on. You know, Alan, thank you for that. So, this is in closing. This 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 three things I'd like the audience to uh, to take note of that I think will 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 be helpful. The first thing is is to know that in our society, um, there's almost no discussion in terms of how to handle losses. So, you know, our whole focus pretty much is, is how to get stuff. You know, how do I get this? How do I get that? Right? But, you know, where's the discussion about, you know, how to handle loss? And so, so that is a discussion that, that, that uh, it's helpful when, when, when you have, and here's, here's what I mean about that. Um, because we're not taught, often when someone loses someone, we, we, we tend to say the wrong thing. So, for example, someone, let's say uh, someone loses a child, and then the person comes up to them and says, oh, well, you can have another child, right? That, yeah. that, 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 that's not going to go down too well. Um, and so, so part of it is, is learning... Um, um, you know, it, it's actually beyond emotional intelligence, you know, which is the, uh, the catch word these days. But, for example, here would be something that you could say to a grieving person. You could say, you know, no one could know, possibly know how you're feeling or what you're feeling, right? right. And that, 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 that allows the, the person to open up or not open up, but it gives them the space. And, you know, my wife Christine talks about that all the time. She said, Bob, you know, sometimes you're in too intense for people. You need to give them more space. And I, and, and I think particularly in the grief context, when a person's grieving, sometimes it's not even words. So the thing is you might say, you know, hey, listen, I'll do the laundry for you or I'll pick the kids up at school or uh, whatever. And because often, Alan, the toughest part is for most people is after the funeral when everybody's gone, you know, every, yeah. everybody's there when, when, you know, you know, for the funeral, the wake, or the repast. But, you know, what, what about afterwards? And so if you can learn to, you know, check in with the person two weeks, two months later and say, hey, listen, um, I'm coming by your house and, um, and I'm cutting the grass for you. I'm coming by your house and I'm going to go do the shopping for you. You understand? Or pick up the stuff yeah. at the cleaners. Or uh, instead of just saying, are you okay? No, yeah. I'm not okay. Right? <laughs> okay, so that's the first thing, you know, knowing knowing what not to say. So don't say stuff like, you know, um, you know, um, you know, you lost your wife. You can get you can get another wife. You can get married again. You lost your husband. You know, you'll, you'll find somebody else. That's not helpful yeah, at, we, at that time. We call that sim- um, sympathy, not empathy. <laughs> Brene, Brene oh, Brown will oh, explain that as sympathy, not empathy. Right, and the, the second thing is that I saw uh, the importance firsthand how support, important having a, a, a support network, your social support network. I found out who were the key family members and friends, and sometimes it's surprising um, the people that uh, come out of the woodwork and 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 are supportive in you know uh, in a way that that uh, exceeds all uh, expectation and so um, I have to say you know Christine and I we experienced kindnesses from family and friends that that just was uh, was amazing that's that's all I say so we are, are, are very grateful you know for that. And then the, the third thing, the third and final thing is because um, at different points I had to be in Christine's, uh, involved in Christine's direct care, and you have to understand this, you know, my wife Christine, she was uh, the type of person that um, 
if she asked for a Band-Aid, she really needed a tourniquet. So when she would ask for help, she really needed it. And so when she was, you know, suffering, she was, you know, every every five seconds, she was like, Bob, I need you, Bob, I need you, Bob, I, you know. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Um, my wife has gone from, you know, asking me for something once every five days to she's asking me for something every five seconds. And so what it gave me, so I basically was totally exhausted um, and sleep deprived and, you know, all of that. Um, you know, I really didn't have any time to experience the trauma. It was just, I was exhausted. So it gave me a new firsthand appreciation for the work that nurses do and that the CNAs do and the home health aides. I had no idea they were working that hard. That is yeah. hard work. Yeah, and my, so my. I think, um, yeah, so, so I, I think, um, you know, um, at some point, you know, we could do a show celebrating nurses and home health care uh, aides, et cetera, um, uh, to talk about, you know, it's an amazing job that you do. And, and um, um, you know, and people don't always say thank you. And, you know, and I was surprised that the hospital at the end, you know, uh, one of our neighbors had sent a gorgeous orchid plant to the uh, Christine hospital room. And so at the end, you know, I turned to the nurse um, and I said, you know, I could take this home or I think maybe I should leave it at the nurse's station. And I just remember at that moment her eyes got so big and it was almost like I could read the bubble above her head was like, you, she's like uh, the bubble above her head said, you mean for us? Somebody's doing yeah. something for us? And so I took it to the, uh, the charge nurse and I put it on the, uh, the counter, her eyes were so wide, and basically she had a look of awe. And so at that moment, um, uh, Alan, I had the realization that, oh my gosh, these people are not used to people expressing that gratitude and, 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 and people saying thank you, because I, I constantly was commending and, 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 and thanking the doctors and the staff because that was Christine's motto. Christine said, catch people doing something right. You know, we live in a blame system where it's like, um, you know, uh, the boss calls the person in. I, I love this cartoon and that it appeared in the Wall Street Journal. It says, Jessup, I made a mistake. You're fired. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hmm. So, so I just want to end on that note, you know, expressing, you know, even in, in, in my law that I was able to express gratitude to the doctors, the nurses, and the social workers, and I actually saw a shift in them, yeah. and, and, and then that was very rewarding, it made me realize how many people are going through life, and they're on their job, and, and it's almost like they're a, a, a dog, where being hit on the, the, the soft part of the nose would roll up newspaper, and so, you know, they're, 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 they're cagey, and if you remember... I remember being in the Bahamas, and I saw this dog, and I went to give him food, and he was—he he wouldn't take it. He was cagey. Yeah. And so I just want to say, audience, if you throughout, you know, can just express gratitude, um, because literally you don't know what is going on with the person that you're interacting with. Yeah. And so, well, yeah, you know, of course, yeah. it's, it's, it's not always, but, you know, that's just, uh, you know, my, my, what I, I learned in this experience, Alan. Yeah, and, and caretaking is not something everybody can do or wants to do. My mother didn't want to do it. And what I ended up doing was calling up one of my best friends who had spent 20 years caretaking for a quadriplegic man. So I knew, you know, having him come up and take care of my father was something that he could do. And fate just put one thing and the other together. He was in between jobs and he came for three weeks and took care of my dad till he passed. And there's no words that I can say to repay him. And as you said, you know, I'll, I'll conclude with this for you, Bob. There, There's really no words I can say. I I love Christine. I love um, her positiveness when we talk, the shows we did together, and, and her, her intelligence, and her ability to make you feel good yet make you think at the same time 
And, and you spoke the same language. She 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 understood your Myers Briggs type, and I she often would say to me, "Oh, you know, you don't have to worry about that with Alan. You know, he's a high J. He he, you know, he'll get it. He's a can do guy." <laughs> <laughs> she she she, uh, she loved she loved the fact that that you actually lived into your calendar, and she said, "Oh, um, you know, I you know, I wish I could live into my calendar." the way that Alan does. So I just want, she gave you the highest compliment, huh. Alan. So I want to really end on this note saying, Alan, let's continue this discussion and to continue it this way. Perhaps we can do uh, a series of podcasts with men talking about, you know, their grief. And then, and, and because this would be, you know, we, we're really going into, you know, uh, you know, uh, like Star Trek, uh, territory to, to really for people to publicly talk about okay so you know um, you know uh, because I know several people where um, let's say they got the phone call that the person was killed in a car crash so they you know uh, or just I was you know that the, the thing that just happened in California where the, yeah. the worker was killed at Trader Joe's it's so unbelievable you know so many unbelievable things and insane things are happening these days so, so I, I would lo love to in the future, and I think that our audiences would enjoy having, you know, some men on to talk about, and, and not to exclude women, because we can have women on too, but I think because, you know, women have an advantage that at least they talk to each other about these kind of things. Mm -hmm. You know, men, if you, if you go and say, hey, listen, uh, I heard your, um, your, 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 your sister died or whatever, and you might get, in some cases, you might get a grunt. They go, oh, yeah, that. Yeah, and that's the yeah. end of the conversation, or that's the extent of the conversation. And what I've discovered is, in many cases, that's all they can handle. You know, that, that if, you, if you pull back the, the covers, you know, they might break down. And so they, they, you know, they don't want to, you know, um, you know, um, you know it, 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 it's, it's showing a level of intimacy where, you know, they're vulnerable, and yes, you know, when you're grieving, you you are vulnerable, and there's nothing wrong with that, and that's normal. But you know, you know, always having to, you know, uh, have this tough guy exterior. Hey, listen, you're hurting. You lost your wife. You lost your puppy of 15 years, yeah. right? Yeah. You you know, a, a, a puppy of 15 years or a cat of 15. That's part of your family. Right. 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 And so, so, so I'm saying that I, I think it would, we could do a public service uh, by, by you know, um, extending this conversation in honor of Christine, in honor of your father, and in honor honoring the uh, other people who have had uh, losses um, of close loved ones or beloved pets, and and you would be amazed how many people are grieving over the loss of their pet. Oh, no, I, 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 I think it's a big thing. And, and I just want to say thank you for, you know, coming on the show and, and talking about, you know, your own personal grief right now as you, as I know you make your way to um, the funeral and, and what is going to be a, a rough couple of days, um, if not weeks. But, um, you know, I'm with you in spirit. And, and again, uh, as, as I like to tell people, you know, this too shall pass. It doesn't say whether it's good or bad. It's just going to pass, and well, Alan, I we'll, just want we'll to want to correct side. you on my side. The the rough part is actually past. Yeah. You know, seeing Christine suffer um, was actually the rough part. Knowing that she's in a state of peace now, um, I'm actually relieved. And so the, the the you know, although it's a funeral, it's actually a memorial service and celebration. So there will be people there who knew Christine before I knew her, who, um, you know, one guy, the pianist, said, oh, I've known Christine 25 years. And so, um, and I said, oh, you know, we were, in September, we would have been married 12 years. So it will be good for me um, and them to hear, you know, what Christine was like before I met her. And so that will be like a healing bomb. So it's really a service of celebration, right. celebrating her memory. And then that is how I'm going forth. That that I, I am I'm cherishing and celebrating the memory of my uh, my my personal unicorn because that was the joke between Christine and I. We're both unicorns.
<laughs> okay. Well, well, you you um you have a safe travels and and do celebrate, do celebrate a life well lived. You know, even even if briefly, she had a big impact on a lot of people. I know. So. Yes, yes, and I'm happy to report. You know, she ran an after school program for ten years that she founded, and uh, one day we were in the elevator. And she said, so these, these are two of my bad girls. And I said, oh, really? And, and then I asked the one uh, sister, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, how was Christine when, when, when they were small and she was managing them in the after school program? And they said, oh, she ironed us out. So I said to the girl, what, what do you do? She says, oh, um, I'm an opera singer. <laughs> I said, an opera singer? So when you talk about impact and... and um, just amazing, uh, uh, you know, Alan, to see, you know, uh, caterpillars transform into butterflies with some guidance. And, and I think that, 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 you know, our children are crying out for guidance. And, you know, when, yeah. you, you know, when, 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 when a person gets the proper support and guidance, then they blossom. Yeah. And so that's what we're looking to do to help others uh, blossom, including ourselves, and so, um, you know, I, I, I will also uh, reach out, uh, Alan, to some um, people who, who do uh, grief recovery podcasts to see if they can join us yeah. in, um, um, in, a, in, in a podcast, um, you know, maybe on Zoom or Facebook Live, and to talk about their individual uh, approaches. These would be uh, primarily uh, uh, grief coaches, right. and um, and so I think that'd be interesting to see what are the approaches and solutions that work real time for people. And I'll see if I can get the grief recovery people because they have a wonderful program that they've been doing for a long time that works for many many people. Okay. Well, that sounds wonderful. Well, thank you. Yeah, and thanks for being on the show as usual, Doctor Bob. <laughs> I will. Um, I'll have links to the Grief Recovery Institute, the handbook you were talking about, and uh, of course your site, and how people can get in touch with you. But thanks for being on Healthy You yet again. Okay, great, Alan. Thank okay. you so much. And this is Alan Eisenberg with Healthy You. Please join us next time. Thank you for listening to Healthy University, brought to you by Bullying Recovery LLC. This podcast does not replace the need for medical advice, professional diagnosis, opinion, treatment, or services to you or any other individual. The information provided here or through linkages to other sites is not a substitute for medical or professional care, and you should not use the information in place of a visit, call, consultation, or the advice of your physician or other health care provider. Join us next time for more Healthy University.